our point. So again, I'll try to break it up into at least two or three parts. To give you an idea of what our lab exercise will be, one person per team of four will go to the biology stock room and check out a micro A and micro B box of prepared slides. It's really careful that you hold the boxes horizontally, don't tip them, sometimes the latches release and all the slides fall onto the floor. When you open the box, make sure all the slides are present and in order. There's a table of contents and index on the inside cover of the micro boxes to let you know which specimen is in which um, spot. Make sure that when you finish with the slide boxes, you return them to their correct numbered slot. You want them right side up and a label facing forward. Um, some of the specimens prepared slides will be on trays in the front of the um, lab, usually at the front of bench two. And then in your lab summary packet, there will be um, directions of which specimen you're going to be looking at and a little bit of description. These are some older um, YouTube videos, um, so they're definitely optional. Um, they're really low quality, <laughs> which you'll see. But a good one, however, folks, is this the third one down here. Um, this is a, a video by another instructor, um, and it covers some of the protists. It has a really nice kind of over, overview of the evolution of life on Earth and touches a little bit on phylogeny. So always good to get more than one perspective. But these are optional videos. So binomial nomenclature is the um, naming system we use to name all cellular organisms. Um, it was developed by Linnaeus. And it is important that you know um, how to provide the unique scientific name for each organism. The unique scientific name consists of two parts, thus two names, binomial nomenclature. The first part is the genus name. The genus name is always capitalized. And then the second part is the specific epithet or species name, and that's always lowercase. When we're writing the scientific names, we always want to make the scientific name appear different from surrounding text. So if I'm writing on a piece of paper or writing on the board, I underline it to indicate it's a scientific name. If I'm using the word processor, I can use italics to indicate that it's a scientific name. And remember folks, since viruses and disease-causing prions are not cellular, we don't use binomial nomenclature in naming them. So first, folks, what we'll do is we'll look at our acellular agents, our misfolded disease-causing prions. And remember, these are um, protein only. They lack nucleic acids. They lack RNA and DNA. And then we'll look at our viruses. And the viruses consist of either RNA or DNA and protein. And some of them we'll see will also carry a stolen host cell membrane, which we call the viral envelope. So first of all, folks, the disease-causing prions, um, we have gone over prions in lecture, so just really, really quickly here. Um, remember, we all have genes um, for prion proteins, so we all make good, normal cellular prion proteins. And this is a little cartoon of the good, normal cellular prion protein. Um, PRP stands for prion protein, and then the superscript C means cellular for normal. And you'll recall from lecture how we described that our good normal cellular prions, which can be denatured, right? They are rich in alpha helices here and have very, very few beta pleated sheets. When they misfold, we'll see that there's a change in secondary structure. There's a decrease in alpha helices here and an increase in beta pleated sheets. So even though the primary structure of the normal cellular prion and the misfold, the disease-causing prion, even though the primary level of structure, the unique amino acid sequence, is identical, what we see in the misfold, the disease-causing prion, is a change in secondary structure. That will cause a change in tertiary structure. And furthermore, the disease-causing prions, they can bind to one another, and thus they achieve a new level of structure, quaternary level of structure. And it's these um, filaments of misfolded prions that somehow trigger our neurons <clears throat> of our brain to undergo programmed cell death apoptosis or cell suicide. And as a result, as we can see in this thin section through the brain 
of a person that's died of a prion disease. This has been stained, and we're looking at it under the light microscope. We can see all these holes that are the result of the disease-causing prions causing the neurons to, um, to die. So as a family, as a family of diseases, prions cause transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. And remember, they're 100% fatal. And sadly, we don't have any treatment for them. It's just really heartbreaking. Here we see from um, autopsy, we see um, um, sections through the brains of two people. The one on the right has died of a prion disease here. And then this is a person that had normal brain, didn't have a prion disease. Some of the prion diseases, um, some of the emerging animal prion diseases include chronic wasting disease of elk, deer, and I've, the last I heard, even moose can get it. So we have chronic wasting disease here in the United States that might have originated here in the United States. Um, and we, we will be talking more about chronic wasting disease in lecture. And then this is another emerging prion disease of cattle, the bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE, um, sometimes referred to as mad cow disease because the, the um, afflicted cattle have behavior changes. And, and my understanding is in Britain, instead of saying, oh, my cows are, are going crazy, a farmer might say, my cows are going mad. And heartbreaking results because it was then discovered that if we eat tissues from cattle that have the BSE prions or are incubating the BSE prions, those cattle prions can bind to our good normal prions and cause them to, to um, misfold. And that has led to a new zoonotic disease that we called variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease. It was first identified in Britain and young people, teenagers, folks in their early 20s that normally should not be developing um, the classic form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, which is usually of old people. Scrapie is another prion disease of sheep and goats. It's probably the oldest recorded prion disease that we're aware of. And it's believed that it was through um, using the bodies of sheep and goats that were infected with scrapie prions. Their bodies were cooked, used to make a protein supplement that was added to the feed of cattle. And so the, the scrapie prion jumped into the cattle, caused their prions to misfold, so we developed the mad cow disease, and then the misfolded cattle prions jumped into humans, causing the variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease. We'll discuss um, Kuru. This is a heartbreaking prion disease of the Foray uh, people of Papua New Guinea. And it was finally decided that the reason the Kuru prion was being um, transmitted um, within these communities was that the Foray people practice um, mortuary cannibalism, and this is when um, uh, a family member, or member of the community dies. The women prepares, prepare the bodies, and then the body is, parts of the body are cooked and then consumed by members of the community. So the hypothesis is, is that may, maybe many generations ago, one of the Kuru elders, excuse me, one of the Foray elders developed the classic form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease. And because then the body was prepared and the body was consumed, and especially the brain, which is really rich in disease-causing prions, um, it was transmitted then to other members of the community. And then they developed Kuru and died. Their bodies were prepared and consumed, and that just spread the Kuru prions throughout, throughout the community. So really heartbreaking. When mortuary cannibalism was halted, then new cases of Kuru um, dropped dramatically. And in lecture, um, I'll provide a link to an outstanding Australian documentary on Kuru. And then here, here folks, this is the uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, CJD. Um, and so, um, as we mentioned, the, the classic form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, sadly, in us old folks, some of us, our prions might start to misfold spontaneously. So we can have like spontaneous development of Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease later in life. Um, heartbreaking is if we go in for a medical procedure and we receive tissues from a person, uh, maybe transplanted tissues from a person that was incubating a prion disease, those transplanted tissues um, can transfer the prions and then we'd have like a, a healthcare acquired prion disease. Um, 
and, and then again, we want to recognize that with variant creutzfeldt jakobs disease, this comes from eating um, beef, cattle tissue, um, containing the, the BSE prion. We do want to recognize that the disease-causing prions, normal autoclaving won't destroy them. Many of the chemicals that we think would denature most proteins, for example, like acids and bases and maybe alcohols, um, many of those chemicals will not denature the misfolded prion proteins. So again, this is kind of a nightmare in healthcare and hospital settings. The next acellular agent that we'll look at are the viruses. So like prions are acellular, but unlike the prions, viruses have genetic information, either DNA or RNA. And the DNA or RNA will be um, protected by a protein coat called the capsid. Some viruses will steal host cell membranes and that will create the outermost layer called the viral envelope. Viruses, remember, are obligate intracellular pathogens or parasites. They can't replicate unless they're inside another cell. The example we have in, uh, for lab for cast of characters is the influenza virus, the flu virus. So again, it's acellular. Influenza viruses have, a, have an RNA genome, and because the enzymes that make copies of, an R, of RNA can't correct mistakes, influenza viruses, like other RNA viruses, have a relatively high mutation rate. Um, influenza viruses, when they're escaping from our cells, they do steal our cell membrane, and that becomes the outermost coat. And this is electron micrograph of the influenza viruses. And the diameter of these viruses is around 100 nanometers. So do remember with viruses, instead of using micrometers to measure size, we use nanometers, 10 to the negative ninth meters. So then, folks, what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll stop this video here, and then we'll do another video um, based on cellular organisms.